And here are the, our roster of speakers. And before I introduce or turn over uh, the mic to our first speaker, Amir Sadegi from uh, the Center for HIV Law and Policy, I just want to make a few quick comments about molecular HIV surveillance, particularly as a person living with HIV since 1995 and a longtime HIV advocate. Uh, a, a real problem with molecular HIV surveillance, as you'll be hearing about shortly, is that this data is collected without the knowledge of the vast majority of people living with HIV. We have no way to, to give informed consent. There is no way to opt out. Now, our concerns are sometimes framed by people in power, um, like at the CDC and the White House and NIH, for instance, as barriers to the ending the HIV epidemic, that uh, asking for informed consent or requiring uh, education on these things is somehow problematic. I would push back on that, and I think you'll hear pushback on that from all of our speakers today. Uh, people living with HIV are in no way uh, barriers to uh, ending the HIV epidemic, and our concerns, uh, our rightful concerns, should not be uh, framed that way. And the idea that you know there are folks in po power and people in health departments who um, you know tell us over and over how our data is protected and there's no way our data will be shared inappropriately. In fact, we can't trust that. Uh, and we will hear some real examples around that. And I'll just bring up uh, something slightly different. It's not a government or a health department, but Vanderbilt University recently just turned over all kinds of um, medical information about transgender clients uh, to the Tennessee Attorney General. Uh, so the fact that our uh, this pub this private health information, protected health information, uh, is kept safe from all kinds of problematic uh, uses is just not true. And so this is one of the reasons, many, one of the many reasons why we have concerns about molecular HIV surveillance. But without further ado, uh, I am going to, uh, well, before I turn it over to Amir, I just wanna highlight our other two speakers, uh, Brian Manalga, who's the deputy director of the Office of HIV AIDS uh, Network Coordination. Thank you so much for being here. And then Andy Spieldenner, um, the executive, executive director of Impact Global Action. We will hear from each of these speakers. We will have a few moments after each speaker to get clarifying questions. And then we hope to have a really robust discussion uh, at the end of each of their talks. So uh, please stick around for the full 90 minutes. And without further ado, I am going to uh, invite Amir to come on camera and uh, start presenting. And I am sharing Amir's slides. So Amir, feel free to just tell me when to move forward. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, hey, good morning from New York, everybody. My name is Amir Sadegi. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the policy and advocacy manager at CHLP. Um, so my little portion of today's conversation is about molecular HIV surveillance and criminalization. Um, and my email's right here, but I can also drop it in the chat. Um, also very happy to share the slides from my portion of the presentation today. So um, next slide, Jim, thank you. So a little bit about CHLP, just in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, CHLP, along with the CIRO Project, uh, founded the first national HIV criminalization uh, a coalition or collaborative called the Positive Justice Project. Um, PJP also supports state level advocacy across the country to reform HIV criminalization laws. Uh, and to that end, we provide legal and policy analysis. We support state coalitions made up of people living with HIV and other advocates with bill drafting assistance. We help develop advocacy materials like, you know, uh, fact sheets and palm cards to help educate um, lawmakers and the community at large about HIV criminalization to encourage uh, that we stop doing that. Um, we've worked with defense attorneys across the country representing people living with HIV in cases. Um, we've also founded the National Prosecutors Roundtable on HIV criminal law, along with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. And that relationship has actually led to um, the reduction of charges and dismissals uh, of HIV criminal um, prosecutions in the past. So um, 
that's a little bit about us. Next slide. And you know, to the, I, since I'm going first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what molecular HIV surveillance is. Um, just a little bit of a baseline uh, for us uh, to have later in the conversation, though we're going to be talking about this uh, for the next hour. So what, what is molecular HIV surveillance? Well, either after you've been diagnosed with HIV or maybe you're reconnecting with care after you perhaps lapsed outside of um, uh, care for some time, your medical provider will order an additional uh, blood sample test. And this test creates a genetic sequence of the HIV virus. And they're doing this to look for mutations in the unique uh, strain of, of HIV uh, that, um, that, that lives inside of you. They're looking for mutations to search for mutations that might make HIV resistant to, uh, to medication. Um, so this is really a, an additional blood sample test. HIV drug resistance testing is a routine part of HIV care. It's done uh, to really effectively manage your HIV, to, to best treat you as a patient. And the test, I think most makes sense to be thought of as something of a direct engagement between your provider and you. Now, what happens next is where a lot of the problems are. And I, I think uh, I think it's it's really important to remember that it, it is it is not ambiguous, right? It is unambiguous that molecular HIV surveillance is controversial. It is it is it has been overflowed with controversy ever since it was made as a requirement for CDC funding for state health departments for HIV prevention funding uh, back in 2018. And if you really think about it from a a, a different dynamic and lens, a more historical one, the controversy around the bodily autonomy and informed consent of people living with HIV, obviously, <laughs> these issues uh, stretch back decades, right? There's a reason why in the Denver Principles, which we just celebrated the 40th anniversary uh, uh, last month, there's a reason why bodily autonomy for people living with HIV is one of the most important principles uh, adopted there. So what happens is that that genetic data that's created for your own individual treatment to best manage your HIV is then uh, that genetic information is shared without the knowledge. So of they the share our information without us knowing. Mm -hmm. they, that's right, uh, Angela. I think that was. I think I can see that was you. Um, that is right. Without you knowing it, uh, without you really explicitly consenting to this. Uh, that data is then shared and it's used outside of your own individual medical treatment. Public health professionals analyze that genetic data. They cross-reference it to other HIV genetic data and they can make inferences on the similarity between this, this HIV genetic data, uh, thereby kind of mapping the sexual and social networks of people living with HIV without their consent or knowledge. And they do this to guide public health action. Um, next slide. So kind of like what I just said, what is molecular HIV surveillance? It's the public health use of individual HIV drug resistance data to map sexual and social networks of people living with HIV. They do this to guide public health action. It has been extremely controversial People living with HIV for years have sounded the alarm about the risks, about issues of bodily autonomy and consent, but not just people living with HIV, right? You, you have bioethicists, researchers, academics, state public health workers themselves raising a lot of these concerns. So um, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, th this is a requirement for HIV prevention funding and CDC and state and local health departments they store, they collect, they analyze, and report HIV drug resistance data to track clusters, quote, clusters of HIV transmission. That's language that the CDC uses. They call this cluster detection and response, or CDR, or, or cluster and outbreak detection, detection and response. Um, there's been concerns about how people living with HIV are reduced to uh, clusters, which is another stigmatizing 
uh, aspect of this. And I, I say that especially because Zero Stigma Day is, 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 is uh, approaching around the corner. Um, there are other kinds of quote cluster analysis that public health professionals can do that don't rely on analyzing this kind of genetic data that's shared uh, without people's knowledge or consent. So that's important to, to, to mention as well. Next slide. So what are the what are the risks? I, you know, I, we have we have a really exciting panel, and I don't want to take too long, so we're jumping straight in. What what, are, what do you maybe maybe you find this pretty alarming? Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about molecular HIV surveillance. Maybe it's not. Uh, but what are the questions that that I think folks have been asking? Some of the questions were shared with us ahead of time, and these were some of the questions that you had. Is molecular HIV surveillance like other types of molecular surveillance? The answer is no. And despite assurances from CDC and state health departments, the comparison or the, 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 the equivocation between molecular HIV surveillance and other kinds of molecular surveillance that we use to track uh, foodborne illnesses should not meaningfully be compared in any way. Why? because HIV transmissions are distinct from other infectious diseases. When HIV transmissions are most likely to occur, they're most likely to occur through things that are stereotyped, stigmatized, poorly understood, like including condomless sex, anal sex, and sharing in injection drug equipment. So molecular HIV surveillance is the mapping of sexual and social networks. It is not meaningfully similar at all to other types of molecular surveillance. And I think it's important to fit molecular HIV surveillance into this, the broader context and history of policies that dehumanize people living with HIV, um, which has been an unfortunate foundation upon which public health in the United States has been built on. Um, next slide. Thanks, Jim, again, for doing this. So do they need my consent to share my health data? The answer is no. Health departments and the CDC argue that they don't really need your consent to use your, your HIV drug resistance data, your HIV genetic data uh, for public health purposes by claiming that your general consent to care uh, gives them the authority to do what they want uh, with this HIV data and use it to guide public health action. And that's that's a, that's a big problem, right? Because as we've been mentioning, most people living with HIV don't even know that their HIV genetic data is being used to map uh, social and sexual networks of people living with HIV in their communities, in their neighborhoods, in their counties, in their cities. So uh, this is really goes again to this stigmatizing practice of, of treating people living with HIV as vectors for a disease rather than human beings with dignity. Next slide. You may be wondering, well, is my data safe at least? That's not so clear. You know, the CDC does claim that they're working to address issues around the privacy of your health data. That is something that they've really reiterated uh, in response to the community activism and into the, in response to the controversy around molecular HIV surveillance. But data breaches do happen. And if you go to the next slide, you can see just a few headlines this you know of, of massive data breaches affecting millions and millions of people uh, whose health data becomes compromised through data breaches and hacks and if you go to the next slide you can see actually this i find this this pie chart really frightening and 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 perhaps very very relevant to this conversation because you can see that the share of hacking incidents that are responsible for data breaches dramatically increasing over the last uh, less than a decade. Dramatically increasing. The, the share of data breaches as a result of hacking, you know, last year, 82% of data breaches were ha uh, hacking related. And if you go to the next slide, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there, there's this report on, on health data privacy and roughly 20 million people were affected by a health data breach in the first half of last year alone. Uh, healthcare providers accounted for 73% of those breaches, and hackers are actually shifting their focus to target specialty clinics, smaller health centers that have more security vulnerabilities. So this is a huge issue. Um, next slide. Next slide. 
So now you really might be wondering, uh, many of you know that, you know, molecular, that HIV is criminalized in the United States. It's criminalized in many other countries. I know we have a global audience today. Can they use my health data against me? Yes. Yes, they can. HIV criminalization is a real risk for people living with HIV. Um, and it's a real risk because anything from your HIV test results to this kind of genetic data can be shared with police and prosecutors and courts and used against you. Most states do have variations of state laws protecting the confidentiality of your health data, except, except when sharing information with law enforcement. There are massive carve outs allowing health information uh, to be uh, uh, shared, to be released with law enforcement agencies and other authorized agencies. Um, so really, we see state health departments cooperate in HIV criminal prosecutions routinely, uh, or they're forced to by state law. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you can see you know, um, our map of HIV criminalization in the US. I know we have a global audience today. I, I'm more of an expert on HIV criminalization in the United States. But if you're joining us here from the US, here's, here's our CHLP map on HIV criminalization. Um, 25 states have an HIV specific criminal law, but it's really important. You know, I keep hearing this from state health departments and from our federal partners working to end the HIV epidemic, which of course CHLP is invested in as well. Um, but I keep hearing, well, we don't have an HIV specific law. That doesn't really matter because 25 states have used the general criminal code to target and criminalize people living with HIV. So the general criminal code, anything from reckless endangerment, aggravated assault, assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder. We've even seen one instance of the state's bioterrorism law used against a person living with HIV, and that was in the state of Michigan. So uh, the general criminal code has been weaponized against people living with HIV. HIV criminalization is also extremely widespread. It is not a rare occurrence. Thanks to the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law, we know that HIV arrests and prosecutions, they don't number in the, it's not a handful of prosecutions, it's not a dozen, it's not hundreds, it's thousands. Thousands of people living with HIV in the United States have made contact with a dehumanizing and violent criminal legal system because of their health status. That is why people are deeply concerned about states collecting and storing information that's gathered without the consent or knowledge of people living with HIV and that can perhaps be used against them. Um, next slide. So that risk is, is real. These are, this is uh, actually very valuable information from NASDAD, uh, their HIV data protection la landscape. These are the states that allow a health department to release HIV data to law enforcement, courts, and prosecutors all of these states. And if you go to the next slide, of those states, these are the states that don't even require a court order to release data. Um, we're also really just seeing state health departments willingly cooperate in prosecutions against people living with HIV as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, here's this is not an exhaustive list, um, and my time's coming up. So this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just to give you a snapshot of this of laws in these states that either permit the release of HIV data for law enforcement or force health departments to share data with law enforcement. Um, so this this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just a, a small example. Yes, thank you, Jim, for keeping us moving. You can just see these are some of the state laws that that either uh, force or permit the release of, of HIV uh, information to law enforcement. So if we go to the next slide, again, as I mentioned, states generally do protect your confidentiality of, of, of personal identifiable information, including your HIV records, your medical records, except carry out public health functions, which some HIV criminalization laws are in the public health code to enforce control measures, i.e. 
HIV criminalization, in response to court orders or subpoenas uh, for first responders, for law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Also, some state and local health departments just make mistakes sometimes and, and, and share information when an intimidating prosecutor uh, you know, knocks on their door. Um, next, next slide. And this goes again with this issue of lane crossing, right? We should have two distinct elements here, public health and law enforcement on the web one side, protecting public health and protecting public safety, allegedly, right? I mean, uh, but the issue is that there's, there's a lot of lane crossing. There's a lot of cooperation between these two uh, uh, entities. And you can see examples of that here but I won't, I won't stick around too long because I, I know we're coming up close. So if we could just keep going, Jim. Um, it, it is important to, to mention that as of right now, molecular HIV surveillance data cannot prove the di directionality of an HIV transmission from one person to another. They cannot uh, rule out an in intermediary in that chain of transmission. However, I wouldn't find that that reassuring just yet. I mean, a couple of years ago, the CDC actually released a statement so concerned about raw next generation sequencing data that they uh, address the risks that outweigh potential benefits. And we all know that medical uh, science and technology is, is, is rapidly advancing. So who knows what's gonna happen in the next few years? Um, next slide. I also really want to say this for, for some of our colleagues who work in public health, who, who maybe find it reassuring that directionality cannot be proven through HIV genetic data. And it, it really needs to be stated that science doesn't rule in criminal legal courts. People living with HIV are criminalized and prosecuted for spitting, biting, exposure to feces, urine, and correctional settings, all things that cannot transmit HIV. Science does not rule in our criminal legal courts and the limitations of genetic HIV data might be misunderstood by juries and by judges and weaponized against people living with HIV. There's already been assumptions about directionality of HIV transmission and prosecutions. Um, and next slide. Um, we cannot wait. This is the last thing I'll say. We cannot wait any longer to protect any and all health data, including HIV test results, MHS data. Because if we wait any longer, it's going to cost lives. It's going to aggravate medical mistrust. We cannot have public health without trust in our public health mechanisms. It's going to fuel HIV criminalization, and it will disrupt the work to end the HIV epidemic. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, uh, you know, turn it over to Jim. Um, I, I had a couple more slides, but I know I've already gone a little bit over Jim. But I'm sticking around. I'm happy to answer questions as we kind of engage in a dialogue after our presenters. Thank you so much, Amir. That was a really great talk. I'm going to just let these slides linger here for a few moments. And uh, I am going to actually stop sharing my screen. And I mentioned that we would take a moment to see if there are any clarifying questions um, before we go ahead and get started with the next uh, presentation by Brian. So. Does anyone want to raise their hand and ask a clarifying question at the moment? Hello. Please. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, go Hi. ahead. My name is Carlos Saldana. I am a physician at Emory University School of Medicine, and I've also been doing work related to cluster detection in Metro Atlanta for um, some years now. And, you know, I think a, a couple of, of comments. I think that. Um, we need to, these concepts, as you know, are very challenging. And I think that we're still using um, words and language that is very difficult for us to understand. So I think I would invite our, our presenters to, you know, try to um, use the uh, language that, um, that can uh, be more understandable. Secondly, I think that um, some of the comments that come up are, um, related to what are the benefits of molecular cluster detection compared to other tools. Um, sometimes the other tools can take several years for us to understand a trend 
uh, of, of how HIV cases are increasing or, or, or decreasing in certain areas uh, with the more traditional tools. I just, so I, before we move forward, I also wanna make sure that some of the benefits of cluster detection at times are that it can more rapidly um, provide information on where uh, HIV is spreading rapidly so health departments can um, focus and prioritize areas in which HIV is spreading at least six times faster than, um, and detecting it at least six times faster than other tools. So I think that that's important for us to, to, to understand. I put some, some links in the chat of sharing the experience of Atlanta that, um, that, 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 that we have. And also prior, and it also mentioned that um, sometimes we all health departments don't have the resources that, um, that for example, California and New York have. Sometimes we do need to, the, the very limited staff that we have needs to focus on those areas in which HIV is spreading more rapidly than, than usual. So I, in, in my personal opinion, it's, it's helpful. I work in public health. I'm also an, an, an academic at Emory and uh, I specialize in infectious diseases. So I, those are the, the, the comments that I wanted to, 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 to bring up. And I appreciate the expertise. Some of the, I, I would love to learn from, from the experts in this room and, and learn more about the concerns. So um, those are the things that I wanted to break up. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Carlos. Much appreciated. And I think uh, we'll, the, the ongoing discussion will be very illuminating for you and everyone else here. Michael, I see your hand up. If you can make your question or comment brief, and then we'll move on. Go ahead, Michael Scarce. Hey there, my name is Michael. I live in San Francisco. Um, I guess uh, my first comment or question um, sort of dates back to something we were dealing with with social network analysis, which is kind of an early version, a non-biomedical version of cluster analysis here. And I'm wondering about the distinction between public health practice and public health research. Um, the laws have been changed so that we are not protected from privacy violations by public health practice. But if we could redefine it as experimental research, we would be granted a number of ethical and practical considerations that were otherwise not available to us. So thanks. Thank you very much, Michael, for making that prescient comment. Um, Amir, do you have anything you wanna uh, relate to that or shall we move on to Brian? You know, I actually think Brian's presentation kind of touches a little bit about that specifically about, you know, the differences between research and public health use of data. Um, I, I imagine, you know, Brian might have some really great comments. I imagine you're right. I think I would agree with that, Amir. And so without, what a wonderful uh, segue. So why don't we go ahead and turn over the mic and the screen to uh, Brian Minalga from Hank. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks um, to Jim, to Amir, to Andy, my co-presenters, and to everybody for joining this conversation. I'm always impressed, you know, when we fill rooms on this topic that used to seem so niche and um, has really garnered a lot of attention. And yes, Michael, um, that's a perfect segue, your question into my presentation. Um, I work at the Office of HIV AIDS Network Coordination, so my world is HIV clinical trials, clinical research. Um, Hank, there we are featured in the middle, we support the research operations of the ACTG, HPTN, impact in HIV vaccine trials networks. Um, so yeah, perfect timing for your question. I'm going to talk a lot about the differences and overlap between the same technology, this use of phylogenetic um, you know, sequencing of HIV between the HIV clinical trials world and the public health use of the same um, technology. So perfect question. Um, yeah, so here's the agenda. We're going to start with a big word. Um, so I know that we're trying to use community language here, but um, let's just, you know, back up and define these terms, um, these multisyllabic words. So I'm going to talk a little bit about phylogenetics, the what and why. Um, I think it, sometimes it helps us to back up especially um, you know, in the field of HIV, topics sometimes can become heated and um, siloed. So I'm gonna take us a little bit out of the HIV world just for a moment, and then I'll bring us back. Um, sometimes I think that helps to reorient us to what we're talking about. We'll talk exactly, there it is on, on the agenda, research versus public health, 
I'll give some specific examples, and I'm going to end with some remarks on, on unity and working together. So let's get right into it. Um, talk nerdy to me. Don't mind if I do. So this is the definition of phylogenetics. Phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary relationships among biological entities. So phylogenetics is not at all limited to HIV. Um, and there's this nice model that we have. And if you just Google image search phylogenetics, you'll find um, this and other models. And what I'll draw your attention to first is that top circle on sequences. So when we're talking about HIV sequences, genetic sequences, that colorful um, chart next to it with the C, T, A, and G, um, mm -hmm. that is what we're talking about. That's what a sequence looks like. Um, what they're doing is they're taking the genetic sequence of the virus, it's not of the person, but the genetic sequence of the virus and comparing those letters, you know, the different amino acids to each other to see whose HIV is related to whose. So that's just an example of what a sequence looks like. Um, then within this model still, they're using those sequences to reconstruct evolutionary histories. You'll see another um, kind of image there below that circle that's what a phylogenetic cluster would look like. So when we talk about clusters, and I'll show another one a little bit later. Um, and we use that information to learn more about evolutionary processes and develop better evolutionary models. So again, um, this is not limited to HIV. It's really um, a, a, something that we use in the field of biology, more broadly speaking. And my first introduction to this term of phylogenetics actually had nothing to do at all with HIV, my first introduction um, to the term was in a field called entomology, which is the study of insects. So um, this is a picture of nine-year-old me. Um, in one hand, I have a monarch butterfly, and in the other hand, I have a clear wing hummingbird moth. This was really my first passion in life, was the study of insects, of entomology. Um, you know, from a very young age, I had this interest in biology, and I ended up going to, um, to school to study entomology. This was my first career path in life, was to become an entomologist. And so the first time I heard the term phylogenetics or phylogeny was in a class I took, a graduate level class. Um, I was in undergrad, but taking uh, graduate level classes in entomology. And it was a class called Insect Taxonomy and Phylogeny. So let's look at these terms for a second. This is taking us out of HIV and I'll bring us back. So um, taxonomy is the system that we use to classify biological entities. So, you know, what makes a moth a moth? What makes a ladybug a ladybug? What makes a fly a fly? This is the system that we call technology and uh, that we call taxonomy, excuse me. And the features that we use when we're looking at insects to determine what class or order or family or species they belong to um, it used to be mostly two tools that we had. The first was morphology. So we would just look at, as entomologists, at the um, wings, you know, the veins on the wings of the insect or the number of hairs between the eyes of a fly. Those days looking through the microscope um, were pretty grueling. So that was one feature that we had to look at just the physical structures of the insects. The other one that we had was behavior. You know, there are some insects that are classified as the social insects, the bees, the ants, and the wasps, and some that are not social, um, but still have different behaviors that we can use to group and classify insects together. But um, this technology then became available of phylogenetics. And phylogenetics is the same thing that I was just showing on the previous slide, where you actually sequence the genome of an insect or certain parts of an insect. And when we started to have that technology available, it completely changed the game of taxonomy. We were finding out from the phylogenetic analysis of insects that insects we thought were related to each other were actually not, and those that we thought were unrelated were genetically and evolutionarily linked. And so what you see here in this big chart is another example of a phylogenetic cluster or a phylogenetic tree showing this evolutionary history and relatedness um, genetically of these different insects. So each line is representing, you know, different families, species, and orders of insects. So um, you may ask, okay, you know, you had all this passion in insects, you learn all of this about entomology, 
why are you not working in entomology? Well, I had a, a change in plans um, because as I got older, I um, and actually still at a pretty young age, um, as a queer person growing up in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, I started to experience more urgent um, issues of discrimination, of oppression, of social injustice, that I wanted to pivot and dedicate my career to these issues. And I recognized that I was going to need a very different skill set, um, you know, from a biology. Uh, bio biologist or entomologist um, skill set that I was gaining by learning about phylogenetics. But I do just want to say that um, I understand the excitement around this technology, around phylogenetic analysis from a biologist perspective. I can really understand that. And so I want to put a pin in that because I think there is a lot of excitement about this technology and, and the power that it has. But I changed paths. Um, I ended up going to social work school to develop skills in you know, addressing social injustice and uh, looking specifically within my community and health, um, health and wellness, and applying these frameworks of social justice to HIV and HIV clinical trials. So um, in doing so, I recognize that people are not insects. I recognize that people are also not clusters. Um, this terminology has been very problematic for a lot of people living with um, and affected by HIV. And as Amir previously noted, HIV is not the same as COVID. HIV is not the same as E. coli. Um, HIV is a very unique condition that is um, constantly and has since the very beginning of the epidemic constantly been framed and punctuated by social injustice, by oppression, by systems of racism, by systems of homophobia, transphobia. And so I recognize even then, you know, when I changed my career path, that the skills of a biologist and, you know, someone who's deep in phylogenetic analysis, that's a very different skill set from someone, um, you know, applying social justice lens to HIV. I think there's overlap between both, and I think we need both um, to end the, the epidemic. So let me just pause here and ask, um, and maybe I'll stop sharing just so I can see folks as well in the chat, but I'm just gonna ask, we can spend you know 20 seconds or so, I'm gonna ask you, the audience, now that I've talked a little bit about the benefits in the world of entomology of using phylogenetic analysis, why do you think that we might want to understand HIV phylogenetics. So I'll stop sharing and see what you see, um, see what you have to say. We'll look at the chat. Any benefits you can think of of why HIV phylogenetics? Very different, obviously, from entomology. Okay, I see some coming in. Yeah, to understand how the virus is changing. Very good, Julie. Yeah, the question, Doug, is why, why would we want to understand HIV um, genetics, HIV evolution, this term of phylogenetics? Thomas is saying HIV phylogenetics may inform development of vaccines and therapies, right? Because you need to understand um, the genetic components of HIV to know the immunology. More robust data translates to competitive advantages among Ryan White. Okay. So there's, you know, um, financial considerations here to understand how effective treatments are. Um, David, very good point. That's one of the major um, uses of phylogenetic analysis is to determine the medication that people can take that um, their virus is sensitive to, meaning they'll respond well to that medication versus others. To raise awareness with politicians in order to increase funding. Yeah, lots of great examples here. Um, so let me just put that question back up. So yeah, I mean, I just wrote down a couple of them. Um, you know, one David noted to understand patterns of HIV drug resistance is another way to put that. Um, we can track using phylogenetic analysis, how HIV is evolving resistance to the drugs that we use to treat HIV. Um, and, you know, the topic of molecular HIV surveillance is to understand patterns of HIV transmission. You can track um, HIV transmission genetically as well. That's exactly what MHS or molecular HIV surveillance is. 
And um, a third point is you can also use phylogenetic analysis to determine when HIV is not transmitted, meaning HIV transmission occurs, but um, you have two samples and the two samples are not genetically related, meaning you know that HIV was not transmitted from person A to person B. Um, so this is another use of phylogenetics. And I wanna talk a little bit more about that last point. Um, and the point I'm making on this slide is that we use phylogenetics in HIV clinical trials. Um, if anyone has ever heard of U equals U, which I imagine probably everyone on this call has heard of U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, this message, this public health message and advocacy message would not be possible without HIV phylogenetics in the context of clinical trials. Um, HPTN052, the partner one and partner two studies, the opposites attract study, all three of those studies that informed the U equals U campaign, they all used phylogenetics. And if you read those papers, um, you'll find that in all of them, and there's even some analysis that puts all of the, the U equals U papers together, what we learned from those studies is that there were zero genetically linked transmission events involving undetectable participants, meaning the people in those studies who were undetectable, there was never a situation out of thousands, I think it was hundreds of thousands of sex events that they captured in the studies, there was never one single situation where someone who was undetectable ha had transmitted HIV proven by the genetic sampling. There were um, HIV transmissions in those studies, but the, um, the HIV that was transmitted was not genetically linked back to anyone who was undetectable in that study. That's how we know that U equals U. So that's one very nice example of how this technology can actually be very beneficial in the context of a clinical trial that ends up leading to a very successful campaign led by people living with HIV, U equals U. The other one I'll just name really briefly here is the AMP trials. This is a vaccine um, vaccine related immunology trial where they were passively infusing antibodies, that's antibody mediated prevention, to see if those antibodies could prevent HIV. And what you're looking at here is these um, genetic samples, another phylogenetic cluster or tree, um, showing what we learned from this analysis is that there were certain strains of HIV that were more or less sensitive to the antibodies that were being used in this clinical trial. And they found that, um, you know, they have this bank of viruses and of uh, genetic samples of viruses. And they found that this bank of viruses that we have kind of on file is outdated. And the samples found through this, um, these two studies, these AMP studies, which were more recent than the bank of viruses that we have, they've changed since that time. So the currently circulating viruses in different parts of the world, you can see the different countries listed here, the currently circulating viruses are different from the ones that these antibodies were originally kind of designed in the lab to, um, to neutralize. And so what this is showing us is that we need to have a better understanding of the evolutionary history and phylogenetic situation of currently circulating viruses to design vaccines, antibodies, other you know, prevention and treatment strategies. So just two examples of how using phylogenetic technology can actually be really beneficial in the context of clinical trials and lead to um, you know, projects or campaigns, advocacy efforts that are well supported and even led by people living with HIV. But there's some important differences between these two worlds, the research realm and the surveillance realm. So I've listed some of them here, you know, in research, there's a clear purpose, um, you know, you have your hypothesis, you have your research question, and there's supposed to be a clear benefit to community and public health, like the two examples that I just showed. Whereas in the surveillance world, you know, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, we just heard Carlos talk about the six times faster, you know, using phylogenetic analysis or molecular HIV surveillance, but you'll see with communities, and I'll show you some slides of quotes from people from Washington State, where the purpose remains very unclear to communities and the benefits still remain unproven relative to more traditional public health surveillance activities. So that's one area where I think we need to discuss more. How can we make um, clearer what are we really trying to do with molecular HIV surveillance?
In the research world, we also have community input, community advisory boards, whereas molecular HIV surveillance was implemented and required by CDC with no community input. That's just starting now. Um, informed consent is required in the research world. In surveillance, there's no informed consent. Um, and even the informed part, most people don't even know that this is happening. Um, in the research world, we have lots of different checkpoints. We have institutional review boards, certificates of confidentiality, which protect federally funded research uh, data. We have ethical requirements. The data protections vary, as Amir was showing, state by state. Um, data protections are going to vary. And even in the research world, the Opposites Attract study that I had mentioned, they specifically thought about HIV criminalization and they wrote into the research protocol protections against the criminalization of HIV through that clinical trial. So what I'm trying to say with this slide is not that the research is perfected and there's no issues with using this technology in research and surveillance is completely bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that the same technology is used in both worlds but the thoughtfulness and criticism applied has been very different. And perhaps the surveillance world can learn and apply some of the lessons from the research world that seems to be quite a bit further along. So I'm going to move right along here. Um, I think I might kind of skip through because I know I'm a little bit um, going into the end of my time here. Just to say really briefly, there's a paper that I think Jim or Jason will put in the chat that talks about this overlap of molecular HIV surveillance and research. So I've, I've been talking about them as two separate things, but there was an example that this paper um, that will be put in the chat describes that happened here in Seattle, King County area, where molecular HIV surveillance data were accessed by researchers. The health department you know, shared these MHS data with researchers to develop this mathematical or this uh, phylogynamic model of HIV transmission based on race, based on age, based on ethnicity um, that communities here in King County found very stigmatizing and problematic. So I just wanted to make that brief note, and I'll be talking about this at IES um, next week already as well. Um, so more information will come about this, but you can also read more about this overlap um, in the paper linked. The last thing that I just wanted to tell you about is this initiative here in Washington State that I conducted with the State Health Department last year in 2022. So um, what we did is we conducted focus groups and did this community education initiative here in the state of Washington, uh, reaching out to people uh, living with HIV and affected by HIV from marginalized backgrounds previously unreached, uh, largely by the health department. And so we went out and educated people about molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and response. And we got their feedback um, on various aspects of conducting cluster detection and response or CDR here in the state of Washington. Um, so I'm just going to show you some quotes here and the four different themes that came up. The first was transparency. People really want to know what is happening with CBR. And there was a very clear theme that people felt that cluster detection and response is being kept hidden. It's being conducted in secret by the health department and by CDC. And here's just a couple of quotes to illustrate this. So one participant said, I can see how they would need more data to make cluster detection effective. I just had my own genetics done through Ancestry.com, and the more people who submit their data, the more information I get into my own ancestry. So I can understand that, and that's not the problem. The problem is if you're doing this behind people's backs and not letting them know. All you have to do is tell me why this is important, and I'm on board, but you're not letting us know, and that seems shady. That seems very deceptive and purposely deceptive. Another participant said, I can speak specifically about being a Black woman. Tuskegee is still something that traumatizes us. And what happened in Tuskegee? They didn't tell the people in that study what was really going on. With molecular analysis, they're not telling us what's going on. It's scary. People are still traumatized about something that happened decades ago. And why? Because it's still happening today. They're still not telling us what they're doing with our data and our medical information. So transparency is really important to communities. Moving right along, um, need is something we've talked about a little bit already. Um, some more quotes here illustrating how people don't understand why this is needed. 
So one participant said, I'm confused about the advantage of molecular analysis. I don't understand how it's better than speaking with people with an HIV diagnosis and their partners and offering services to communities. Shouldn't you just outreach to everyone who is out of care, no matter what strain of HIV they have? I would also like to know the time and financial costs of molecular analysis in relation to other HIV activities. Is molecular analysis taking resources away from other HIV services? Another participant said, I think this is something that was missing from the DOH presentation when um, our Washington State Health Department presented to these communities. The participants said they talked a lot about what's being done with the data, but not what's being done with boots on the ground. I didn't realize that there was any kind of failure going on that necessitated, necessitated us having to map HIV molecularly. So I think what's missing there is what kind of services are being provided immediately to individuals. The third theme was context. And um, oftentimes we talk about how you know, cluster detection and response vary state by state. But even folks in uh, who we spoke with in Washington talked about folks within a county or even within a city that is going to land differently with different people. So one participant said, I'm speaking from a place of privilege here. For me, I'm like, yeah, go ahead and take my information. But I completely see how this would not be OK for some people. As far as looking at the populations we're serving, it's really important to consider how things need to be from their perspective. And another participant said, if I think back to when I was first diagnosed in that room, I didn't want you to give me all the molecular stuff. I really just wanted to not be scared that, that I'm about to die. Think about being a person of color or a woman or transgender. You're going up against a lot. Your family may or may not accept you or your community. You're pretty much by yourself. So people are still battling all these things and you wanna do all this molecular analysis on them. It doesn't work that way. So what a lot of people were saying is that there's still all these unmet basic needs that people living with HIV, people experiencing homelessness, people who are dealing with addiction um, that are still being unmet. And this technology seems a little bit you know, above and beyond um, the basic needs. And the last point, I think I'll skip the quotes, um, but the point is that people wanna be involved and have community input, especially with regard to language. You know, There was a comment made about um, is the language we're using not community accessible? Well, one thing that hasn't been done is asking communities what language should we be using at the health department? What language should, should CDC be using instead of clusters and molecular HIV surveillance and phylogenetics? We haven't given people the opportunity to have their input and their voices heard. So um, in summary, um, HIV phylogenetics, this is from uh, another paper we had published, HIV phylogenetics is a powerful technology with the potential to benefit and harm communities of people living with HIV. Addressing criminalization and including people living with HIV in decision-making processes have the potential to meaningfully address community concerns. Um, that's from the paper that I had um, linked before. My final remarks. Um, sometimes we need to remember that our goal here is to end human suffering caused by HIV and people living with HIV and advocates want to realize this goal. Um, Jim said it at the beginning, sometimes there's this narrative painted that people living with HIV, you know, are not interested in molecular analysis because it's, you know, counterintuitive to public health or, you know, these different kind of narratives painted about advocacy um, that is raising very real and valid concerns about this technology. So I think we need a little more unity around this um, to unify around the goal and remind ourselves that we're all working toward the same goal of ending human suffering um, caused by HIV. And we should hold each other accountable while remembering that we're on the same team. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to express concerns. Um, and to remember as well that there are those who do not share our goal, um, who are not on our team. And it's going to be much more difficult to go into these social and political battles with people who really don't share our goal if we're not all unified and on the same team. Um, so that's just the last remark that I wanted to make about that and say thank you. And here's a little um, beetle that visited me just a couple of weeks ago. So we're still on board with the entomology. Thanks so much. Loving those bugs, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really beautiful presentation. A lot of um, appreciation in the chat.
uh, and super um, informative and contextualizing and educative. So thank you so much. We are kind of at a time situation. So I think we're gonna move forward to um, uh, bring on Andy Spieldenner. And once Andy is done with his remarks, we will open it up to more Q&A and discussion. We are noting your questions in the chat. We're trying to answer them as they come up. And there'll be a few that we will take forward into the discussion, at which time we'll also ask people to raise their hand and talk. So we're, we got about another 25 minutes. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the wonderful Andy Spieldenner of MPAX. Thanks, Jim. Um, uh, thanks, Amir. Thanks, Brian. This is uh, always wonderful to present with these folks. Um, a couple, I, I'm going to start my presentation, sorry, um, a little bit about MPACT. I'm Andy Spield, and I'm the executive director of MPACT. We are a global organization that works primarily in gay, bi, trans, queer, and other uh, men who have sex with men um, rights in the HIV response. And in that work, we work with UNAIDS, WHO, the Global Fund, PEPFAR, and um, we work all over the world. And so my talk is really going to focus on opportunities for advocacy. I just want to disclose a couple things. Number one, I am a person living with HIV. I've been living with HIV since, I don't know, I think since treatment started. So I was lucky that way. Um, I got diagnosed like the year after treatment was made available um, in the U.S. And uh, and so I, um, so I come to this conversation with that in mind. Um, one of the things about doing global work, and I just want to point this out, Amir did a great job contextualizing HIV criminalization in the U.S. I want to point out that um, this kind of technology is being used across the world now. We're exporting it and we're requiring grantees under PEPFAR to utilize it. And one of the challenges is that HIV is not the only thing criminalized in the world. Drug use is still criminalized. Sex work is still criminalized. Um, uh, gay sexual uh, uh, contact is criminalized all over the world. Um, there are still 70 countries that criminalize um, gay sexuality. So I really want to um, point out that this criminalization case is actually a larger conversation. And um, for those people who uh, question whether or not those are related, I, I would argue that as a gay man living with HIV, whether I get arrested for being gay or because I'm HIV positive and having sex are not actually important to me. The fact is that I'm being arrested for my identity. So um, or that I'm persecuted and discriminated against. So I really wanted to make that clear that, you know, this, this technology actually um, has impacts in other parts of our lives and our communities. Uh, and that's my email, Twitter. Is Twitter still a thing? I think it's over. But anyways, and that's my Instagram, um, which is still a thing. <laughs> so I did bring up that there are some successes in um, like HIV surveillance. I think Carlos has brought that up also in the questions that he had brought to his first, um, to, to Amir's conversation. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that the successes that we've seen are really around people who use drugs in the United States. Um, and the, one of the reasons why that's been successful is it's mobilized resources to provide harm reduction and other services to places that didn't have it. And one of the questions that one of my colleagues always brings up is, well, why weren't these already being provided? <laughs> this doesn't make sense if you knew there was a drug using population. Um, and we can talk about that. There's obviously a politics of public health. It's not neutral which I hope you get from this a lot. But one of the reasons we're concerned is the lack of community engagement, HIV criminalization and discrimination and cost effectiveness. So the lack of community engagement, um, I'm old enough that I remember when we switched from anonymous to namespace reporting in the US um, around HIV testing and surveillance. And to make that transition, we actually had years of community consultations with CDC and health departments. And really communities were able to understand what were the safety concerns? What were the uh, security protocols? And with that in mind, people kind of went into names reporting with like, okay, we understand it, we get it, it's good. None of that happened with molecular HIV surveillance, none of it. And so one of the questions that's raised there is why was that not part of it? Why was community consultation not part of this process? HIV criminalization and discrimination, I did want to point out that the safety and security protocols that we were guaranteed when names reporting happened didn't protect anybody from 
um, discrimination or criminalization. And mind you, criminalization affects you not only if you get sentenced, but the whole process affects you. So the moment a police officer comes by or you get told by a, by a prosecutor um, that this is part of your sentencing, you could have a felony based on your HIV status, that that actually disrupts your life. Um, you might lose your job because you're in the process of dealing with the courts. You're, you might um, lose your friends. Um, and then there's the secondary things. And I think many of us in the gay community have seen this on Grindr and some of the other apps where people expose your HIV status on them and call you like an HIV fraud or things like that. Um, I don't do the apps, but uh, I've heard that's a thing. And finally, cost effectiveness. We haven't yet seen if it's cost effective. And one of the things I always like to point out is that what cluster detection has told us is that people who use drugs, people who are radically housed, people of color, gay, queer, and trans people are most likely to not be in care and require, and all of these populations require targeted HIV services. That is the same data story that we've been told since the beginning and that we've been telling with public health from the beginning. So I don't, I, I really question the cost effectiveness. One question that people has, have is, can we do anything about this? And I do want to point out that across the world, we push back against biological markers in all of HIV services. So there are some countries, for instance, that have proposed HIV testing, um, require fingerprinting, um, and other kinds of biological markers to go along with your data. And we've been able to fight that globally. We also recognize that one of the things we can do is really talk to our health department, health ministries to ask about what surveillance tools they're using and what they do to protect community data. Where this becomes particularly important are places where other identities are criminalized. So for instance, in Uganda, if you have a cluster of all men, that tells you something and it actually violates the law that was recently passed in Uganda about um, gay sex. And um, so what can the health ministry do if that happens? And that's a question we should all be raising. Related to that is find out if law enforcement is able to access public health data and under what conditions. The United States is very different from many parts of the world. The United States does not have a firewall against law enforcement, does not. Many countries actually do not share data from public health to law enforcement, but it's important to find out what your local context is like. There are some examples of community advocacy on molecular HIV surveillance. Um, these are all links that will be in the presentation, but the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS um, had a re resolution in the United States about data protection and molecular HIV surveillance. In Kenya, Kellen, the organization um, Alan Malechi uh, runs, um, has been producing reports, educating the community, and advocating in legal policy set settings about data protection of rights. In the US, the US People Living with HIV Caucus, the Positive Women's Network, Positively Trans, Zero Project, and Thrive SS hosted a series of community education webinars. I put the article that was written about it there. And there's been a lot of uh, concerns raised in multiple academic journals, and I put those there. Some key asks across all of these advocacy efforts is data protection. Keep data, individual level data anonymized and firewalled from other government agencies. Safety and security assessments, really making health ministries look at and health departments look at what kinds of country, state safety and security protocols are necessary to protect people who are radically housed, trans people, migrants, people of color, gay men, people who use drugs, sex workers. These are all very highly policed populations. So what are we doing? What can be done to protect the data? Looking at cost effectiveness, is, the best, is this the best use of resources and why? Um, and for some public health agencies, uh, they use this specifically because there's been a lack of political will dealing with some communities, and so they're able to use this public health information to ignite a fire under politicians. That's a practical thing, and, and it's not about, you know, it's about uh, mobilizing resources using political, um, using politicians. And the final thing is community engagement. We really need to have ongoing and um, ongoing consistent community engagement with those most impacted by HIV. Public health is a partnership. We learned that during, that, that came home really hard in the last pandemic that we're still experiencing um, around COVID-19, that public health is a partnership. So we do need to think of it that way. I wanna end with talking about the fragility of community trust. And I bring this up partially because um, Amir had talked about people in power kind of denigrating 
um, activists who are raising concerns and issues. And I want to remind people that this community trust with public health is very fragile. It's fairly recent. So in the first two decades of HIV, governments did very little around the HIV epidemic because they thought that um, we weren't worth it and that the people that um, they, they didn't want to deal with the communities that were actually getting HIV. And we fought really hard as people in with HIV, as people of color, as sex workers, as people who use drugs, as immigrants, to be able to get meaningful participation. And this has been embodied in the Denver principles. And today we have the greater involvement of people with HIV, AIDS, and the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, AIDS. And GIPA and MIPA are two principles around who gets invited to the table and who gets to make decisions about their lives. While those relations have improved over conflict, cooperation, and compromise, it's still fragile. And so when we raise community concerns, they should be at least acknowledged and discussed meaningfully, not dismissed as if we were um, saying the sky's on fire. And with that, I'm gonna close my presentation. Thanks. And check the chat. There is a lot going on in the chat. Uh, the chat has been really robust. Thank you to everyone who's engaging there. And big thanks to all of our speakers um, for really, really wonderful talks today. We do have about 14 minutes to engage in conversation. And while we're teeing that up, I would love to see some folks raise their hand if you're interested in coming on camera. Oh, great. So why don't we, and if we can keep your question or comment brief so we can get through as much of this as possible. Uh, and I will say that this is a very rich and uh, full discussion, and there's a lot to unpack here. So the choice agenda, among other folks, but the choice agenda will be doing another webinar on this topic area um, in the coming months towards the end of the year. But why don't uh, we recognize Ahmad and go ahead and ask your question, make your brief comment, Ahmad. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, I hear, you know, stigma brought up a lot. So my question is, from the perspective of people who do not have HIV, when they hear, like I teach in Atlanta, Fulton County, um, and when HIV went from being considered a felony to a misdemeanor, all the students in my class were alarmed, right? They were like, well, see, now I have to protect myself as much as possible because the government won't do it, right? So when we talk about decriminalization, my concern or question is, have you considered the reaction of the general population and how that could create a more hostile environment towards people living with HIV. Thank you, Ahmad. Um, maybe Amir or any of the folks might want to take this on, but I this seems like an Amir question to me. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Ahmad, if I could ask you to just clarify, do you mean do you mean like the activism uh and legitimate concerns about molecular HIV surveillance maybe tipping off a public reaction? Or do you mean like the general public learning about public health practices that happen without people's consent? Like, and I think, so what I mean is like, if people find out, or if, if we make the push for MHS surveillance, you know, MHS to be decriminalized and completely, right? So stop collecting this data. If people in the general population feel less safe, because they feel like the government is not tracking something that for them is a major concern, their reaction most likely would be to protect themselves by ever, whatever means they feel is appropriate. And my concern is that people in a general population are not educated enough to come up with what I think would be a reasonable reaction. So then their reaction might be one that creates a more hostile environment for people living with HIV. Yeah, I think I, think I understand now. Thank you for your question. I'm happy to start, but I think you know, Brian and Andy are are both really well equipped equipped to talk about this too. But I think the first thing I would say is that that hostile environment is the reality right now. Like people living with HIV are subject to not just state violence, not just arrests and prosecutions, but like interpersonal violence every day. And that so that that hostility, I think, is is very is a real context that needs to be thought of. Uh, as we approach zero stigma day, um, we, you know, but I, I think I, as a counterpoint to, to your, I think your good question, I would, I would counter argue uh, by suggesting that ordinary people 
people who maybe don't have the most education about like phylogenetics and molecular HIV surveillance and stuff are already appreciating the risks of health information falling into, let's say the wrong hands, uh, health information being weaponized against people, right? We live in a post row, uh, world now. We live in a post Dobbs world now. Um, the constitutional rights to bodily autonomy and reproductive rights to the constitutional right to an abortion has been stripped and prosecutions are happening for people seeking reproductive health care for seeking abortions and health information is being shared in those prosecutions. There is a report. I'm going to find a, a link. Uh, I, it's hard to do while I'm chatting, but um, if, when, how, which is a reproductive justice organization, did a, has shared preliminary data about uh, the prosecution, the criminalization of self-managed abortion, um, so either people self-managing their own abortion or uh, someone helping them uh, self-manage their abortion. Care providers are the most responsible group for alerting police about these cases. 40, I think 45% of these cases that come to the attention of police were actually alerted by care providers. It's more than any other group. So people I think do understand, I think right now, living in the United States of America, in this country with a weak health system, right? We. Our, our viral suppression rates are, are woefully behind other high income nations. We have a weak and imperfect health infrastructure in this country. And uh, we also have a weak data infrastructure in this country where information can be shared and weaponized against you. I think people do appreciate that. People are aware of that. And I actually would give ordinary folks a lot more credit to understand that hey, my private, I, potentially identifiable medical information shouldn't be used against me. It should be about my health. I think, I would like to think that a lot of our public health allies feel the same way. You know, I agree with Andy that public health is not with a, without a political uh, um, analysis and background. I've heard state health departments support, uh, you know, quarantines and isolations of people living with HIV um, against, against their will. You know, I've, I've heard lots of things from state health departments that are really problematic. Um, we still, I think, have to talk about provider bias. We have to talk about public health bias and provider bias against people living with HIV. It is a very real thing. Um, and I just would give more credit to ordinary people to understand health information should be protected from the release to law enforcement. Uh, and, and that isn't the case right now. That is not the context that we live in. So let me just follow up. So I don't, I don't think people don't get that, right? I think, so I think, I guess my response to that would be then, I think you would get more buy-in if the push or the advocacy was for preventing all medical information from being, you know, criminalized and police being able to call a health department and get that information. But when people hear it's specific to HIV, I think that's where the disconnect happens. If people say you're protecting all of our data, mines, theirs, I think people would jump on board and we would get more support. Thank you for that. And thank you for the really great question. And again, uh, calling out what's happening in the chat. It's, it's, there's a lot going on there. It's really major. Thank you. We will be sharing all of the resources that are in that chat in a resource document that will be posted alongside the slides and the recording. Everyone on the webinar will get an email when all that's available, usually within a day, and it's all available always on the Choice Agenda website once they get posted. Um, I do want to go back to some questions that came up earlier, and this the three of you could jump in and let's keep track of time here. We have six minutes. But Gail had asked a question early in the discussion, kind of comparing what we would consider regular surveillance or normal surveillance, what we've been doing, names-based reporting, like Andy mentioned, with molecular HIV surveillance. So would one of you I would like to kind of compare and contrast what we've been doing with surveillance, uh, typically with um, 
molecular HIV surveillance, which we've been doing uh, less amount of time. I'll just say a, a brief comment about that is a question I'm always asking um, in this space of molecular HIV surveillance is what specifically do the molecular data enable us to do? And what I've been seeing is, you know, examples brought up, these success stories of molecular HIV surveillance, CDR. Um, there's an example um, actually that was shared, you know, from Atlanta about um, having more linguistically competent, you know, culturally competent resources available for um, people who speak Spanish in the Atlanta area as thanks to MHS. There was an example in Detroit that now transgender women can gain access to gender affirming hormone therapy thanks to molecular HIV surveillance. But I think the question that I would ask to kind of answer your question, Gail, is um, how is the molecular data specifically enabling us to provide services that, in my opinion, we should be aware of our needs in the first place? We should already be providing linguistically appropriate, competent care, culturally competent care and resources for people who speak Spanish. We should already be prioritizing, you know, people accessing gender affirming hormone therapy. So why is it that we suddenly need this molecular data? You know, can't we already have community engagement and um, and relationships with communities to know what their needs are and provide them without needing this molecular analysis that is so controversial? Thank you for that, Brian. And Andy or, or Amir, anything you want to add? No? Okay, I think another question that came up uh, was just, you know, if you could compare and contrast the use of phylogenetics or molecular HIV surveillance with fingerprints. Anyone want to take that on? And I know there's so many other questions in the chat that we're not getting to, but these are a couple that jumped out for me. Yeah, it's a little different. You know, a fingerprint is unique to you um, as an individual. And I, I don't know that, I mean, with the data that are collected and stored, you know, they do have your genetic HIV's genetic sequence plus your information that goes along with it. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's an analogy that I can appreciate. I also really like the analogy made about ancestry.com, you know, comparing other people's, you know, DNA genetics to each other to kind of create these um, ancestry trees or phylogenetic trees. Um, so yeah, I think the, the analogies can be helpful um, in trying to explain these to community members. I also think that understanding these biological markers as a joint concern for communities, particularly those most marginalized, discriminated against um, in your local context, I think that that's really important to understand all of these biological markers have some kind of danger attached to them and risk. Um, and I think it doesn't do us any favor to minimize those risks or pretend they're non-existent. Thank you for that. So we are in the last couple minutes and I am going to do a quick wrap up myself and then I'm gonna ask each of our speakers to leave you with one juicy nugget to take. There's been a lot to absorb today. So if there's one juicy nugget that you wanna make sure everyone has with them from here and evermore, um, I want you to share that. Uh, so you can think about that while I just make a few logistical things here. Um, our next webinar is August 3rd. Tale of Two Cities, uh, unpacking what happened in Brisbane and Chicago, or what will have happened in Brisbane and Chicago. So I hope you will join us for that. Uh, and we will be doing for sure another webinar on this topic, seeing as how it is uh, so, uh, it's of great interest and there are so many angles to deal with here. We really focused a lot um, domestically. We would also be interested in doing more globally on this as well. And finally, I see a lot of people talking about sharing resources. Uh, please send me resources that you didn't get to put in the chat. You have my contact information. If you got a, you signed up for this registration, you've gotten an email from me. So send me that and I will include those in the resource document and try to do that um, at your earliest convenience. So with that said, I'm gonna go around the table here. We're gonna go um, alphabetically. And so I think, that would, I'm gonna do alphabetical by first name. So we're gonna start with Amir and Andy, and then Brian will bring up the rear. Yeah, we're, we're stacked at the beginning of the alphabet, but um, uh, 
So my little nugget, I think I, it's, I got the sense that there are a lot of people who work in direct services, clinicians, people who work in public health here. Please check out this resource I dropped in the chat. It's from Interrupting Criminalization. It's called the Beyond Do No Harm Principles. It's for care providers more specifically. I think it is equally useful for people working in public health or people working around you know, the intersections of, of care and, and public health. It is, it is an important set of principles for providers and other healthcare stakeholders to, in your own community, start getting the work started that we've been talking about, about, stop, stop, about protecting health information from being weaponized against marginalized communities. We need more prison industrial complex abolition education for folks. We need people to, to have some level setting about what the American criminal legal system actually is. It's, it is here to regulate structural violence and, and, and deep inequalities, social, gender, and racial inequalities. That is what our criminal legal system exists to do. And uh, the Beyond Do No Harm Principles is a great resource to get that work started in your community if you work in, in health. Thank you, Amir. Andy. So I just, you know, I do think that um, there's health departments have to be okay with making mistakes and acknowledging that they make mistakes. So when we talk about, you know, this technology is out there and people are using it, but often what happens is the messaging when they discover a cluster is very awkward, marginalizing, or actually harmful. And I think it's hard for health departments to hear that some of what the way they're messaging might not be acceptable to the community. And I think that that's something to kind of acknowledge that this is an ongoing communication dialogue and it should be a dialogue. Um, there was a, a incident in Seattle and Kings County Health Department uh, announced that they had a cluster of uh, homeless women that use drugs and uh, that, please help identify them. And it was very problematic. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't a useful public health messaging. And instead of acknowledging that and trying a new message, they got very defensive about it. So I think, you know, and I don't mind calling people out. Um, but uh, I think that that's something that we all have to acknowledge as, as a partnership is that that's part of a partnership is acknowledging when we oops it and um, kind of making it better. Um, so just working with communities in a more meaningful way. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Brian. My closing remark is um, kind of always my closing remark, which is we are all on the same team and we need to remember that we don't always model that. Um, you know, it's not helpful to label communities of advocates as anti science um, just for raising very valid concerns. This field of HIV takes a lot of different kinds of expertise. We need evolutionary biologists as much as we need community members, as much as, much as we need CDC staff, health department staff, the expertise at NIH, people who run clinical trials. But let's not um, devalue um, the perspectives of people whose lives are already so devalued in our society, communities of color, trans folks, you know, all the folks um, that we are constantly talking about you know, as key populations, well, are we really making them key populations by labeling them anti-science, by, um, you know, devaluing their perspectives? So let's remember we're all on the same team and everyone's perspective is going to be needed to end the, ep the epidemic. Wow, what a beautiful set of closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Amir, Andy, and Brian for really remarkable presentations today. Thank you to our really engaged audience. I have, I don't know, I don't think I've ever seen a chat quite so intense and so full. Um, it's gonna, uh, I will do what I can to uh, collect some of these comments and share them in the resource document. We don't typically do that, but there's so much, um, so many good nuggets in there that I don't want them to go missing. And uh, if I was having a hard time keeping up, I'm sure all of you were too. So we'll, we'll do our best to sort of pull some of that together um, look for uh, an email from us in the next day or so when all these things come online. Please stay engaged with the choice agenda. Please join our list where conversations like this can happen all the time, every day, nonstop, 24-7, if you so desire. Um, but with that said, thank you all for spending time today or this evening. For some of you, it's already tomorrow. Um, our friends in Thailand, if Udam is still here, you're a rock star for showing up so late or so early, however you look at it. 
Thanks for being here. Thanks to everyone. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much.